of God the Holy Spirit and in the divine dinosphere, which of course is the only place where doctrine can be understood. Therefore, before we start our study this morning, we're going to take our normal few moments of silence, which is designed to give every believer priest both the opportunity and of course the privacy to make all those decisions necessary for a proper study. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you that once again, from your perfect faithfulness, you've recognized our every need and our capacities, and in fulfillment of the plan that you've provided for us, you've given us yet another opportunity to gather together as a local church to study your word. And then as a result of its application, to develop capacity for life, for love, for happiness, for blessing, for service, and of course to handle those pressures and problems that you know are in our immediate future. We ask now that God the Holy Spirit would provide for each of us concentration, self-discipline, genuine humility, and anything else we might need for a proper study. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, First Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 8 and 9. Whom not having seen, you love. In whom, though not seeing him now, but believing in him, you exceedingly rejoice with joy inexpressible and glorious, obtaining the outcome of this faith, <clears throat> salvation of your soul. And then verses 10 and 11 say concerning this salvation so we're talking about the salvation the prophets who prophesied concerning the grace into which you would reside and that's your grace diligently sought out and meticulously inquired carefully inquiring into who or what circumstance the spirit of christ in them <clears throat> was revealing when predicting the suffering of christ sufferings of christ and the subsequent glories and then last week we got into 12 oh before we did this uh I, I had some really good feedback from last week, and when, apparently when I was tired, I uh, jacked things up a little bit here, and so the points on the screen didn't quite read, right? <laughs> and so I've, I've cleaned those up, and basically the points that we had said some Old Testament believers were indwelled, okay? So they're, 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 we, had, we talked about the indwelling of God and the Holy Spirit. Some were actually indwelled, not all of them. Remember, we didn't have the universal indwelling. The Old Testament, as a result, Old Testament believers could lose the indwelling. Okay, you have that evidenced by the fact that David in the Psalms prays that uh, the, uh, the spirit not be taken away from him. Okay, and it was a form of divine discipline to actually lose the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. We saw that Old Testament believers could ask for God the, for indwelling of God the Holy Spirit, and it's improper for us to ask for it. We have the automatic indwelling of God the Holy Spirit when we, are, when, when we uh, accept Christ as Savior. So when we become believers, we automatically get the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. And so we don't need to ask for it. So things like uh, taking, and that's again another understanding of dispensations, is taking something from an old dispensation where they ask to be indwelled. That's not right for us. We already have it as part of the royal family. Uh, we saw that Christ gave the Holy Spirit to the ten disciples to maintain their status until the church age. This was the time uh, before the Pentecost. It was time from, uh, excuse me, from his resurrection to the, to, until the Pentecost when, uh, when uh, uh, the, the church age begins. And so that little time period. And so when we study things like Acts, for example, we have to be careful because Acts is a very transitional book. The believers in Acts at the front of Acts are in uh, one dispensation. By the time you get to the end of Acts, they're in the, they're in the church age. <laughs> okay, So there's, there's a transition that goes through there. We need to make sure we understand when that transition occurs. And so during this time period, uh, Christ knew that these individuals were going to need the power brought by the indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit. And so he gave it to them until after Pentecost, until Pentecost, and then of course at Pentecost and after, at the beginning of the church age, every believer then received the, uh, the indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit. The, and that's what point five told us, was that the church age brought universal indwelling, and the church age believer cannot lose the indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now during this time, <clears throat> I also indicated that uh, there's a, there is a universal indwelling, not only during the church age, but also during the millennium. Okay, and that's something that we hadn't studied in the past, uh, but it's something that uh, I've, I've uh, been digging into and finding out. Okay, uh, Schaefer, uh, one of the one of the uh, great theologians, uh, Louis Ferry Schaefer, uh, uh, indicates that. Uh, Colonel Theme actually indicates that. Okay, and more importantly, the Bible indicates it. And so, if you're wondering about the information concerning the filling of the Holy Spirit during the millennium, I have a couple passages to refer you to. Okay, and so it's Ezekiel 36. 25 through 31. And then Ezekiel 37, 14. Another Ezekiel passage, Ezekiel 39, 29. And Joel 2, 28. 
during the Ezekiel passages, we have, we have uh, Ezekiel prophesying on the uh, coming back together of the, of the uh, uh, priest nation of Israel, okay? And it's not the part that's during the, the uh, tribulation, it's actually during the millennium. It's because they're receiving their, their land, their inheritance, and that happens, okay, uh, initially during the millennium. Okay, because Christ is going to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he's going to rule over the land that's given to the Jews, okay? And during that time period, it says, all will be indwelled. I will give my spirit to all, okay? Not just to the Jews, but to all, okay? And then in Joel, <clears throat> what we actually have leading up to Joel 2.28, yeah, is that we see the invasion of the north, which is in Joel 2, 1 through 10, okay? And that's going to be the equivalent I'm getting ready for Armageddon because an Armageddon is in is actually uh, uh, two eleven, Joel two eleven, and then you have Israel being regathered and converted in Joel two twelve through seventeen, and then essentially you have the Lord's second advent in Joel two eighteen through twenty seven. Okay, so that by the time you get to Joel 2.28, you see the, uh, the, the, the spirit being given, and it's obviously given during the millennium. Okay, so I wanted to, I wanted to uh, justify my comment. It's something, again, uh, the millennium itself is something that's very uh, uh, difficult to actually get a lot of information on because it isn't covered that well. Okay, the Bible is very, very cryptic as to exactly what's going to happen in the millennium. Okay, and so you have to use a little bit of logic from different passages. Now, this is... This is um, uh, cryptic enough that there actually are categorical churches that do not believe that you're going to have um, in the universal indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. So not all uh, fundamental churches believe this, okay? <clears throat> so but that's okay. There's fundamental churches that still believe you have to have, actually have to have the baptism, okay? Water baptism, uh, which we don't, <clears throat> we don't have. Then one other thing, is I want to make a correction on the actual corrected translation of verse 12, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Libby caught the fact that, uh, which was absolutely correct, the fact that altos, when I was doing altos, was not nominative. It was actually <clears throat> attributive, or not, excuse me, attributive. It's, uh, it's accusative, excuse me. Yeah, thank you. It wasn't nominative. It was accusative. And so accusative means that it's not in the first part. I didn't need to have these things in the front. It has to be actually go in the back. Okay, and so you used to, it, where the verse used to say they administered doctrine, slant, prophecy. I didn't need to add that because actually what they administered was already there by Altos. It was these things. Okay, so and, and the fact that dia, diakoneo was in the third person that gave us the they. Okay, not the Altos didn't give us the they. The fact that diakoneo was already in third person gave us the they. So when you look at the verse, it should now read this. It was revealed. To them, and that's still underlined, that not for themselves, but for you, they administered these things, comma, and then the rest of the verse is the same, which now has been reported, slant taught to you, through the ones having proclaimed the good news, slant gospel to you, with the power of the Holy Spirit, having been sent from heaven, into which angels have a strong desire, slant longing, to intently look, slant examine. Every now and then, this little guy, and it only happens here. It's kind of interesting. It's uh, the angelic conflict here. It resets. Okay, so <clears throat> those were... Uh, Good corrections, and I, of course, always appreciate when, you know, when you have corrections or you have questions, so don't be afraid to ask, okay? Particularly when I'm <laughs> teaching something where I, you know, ended up not getting a whole lot of sleep, I guess. I need to start making sure I get a, a much earlier start. Okay, so I'm waiting for this little guy to come back up. <clears throat> like I say, it's really weird. A short class. I have to go print something if it doesn't come back up. I get a screen that looks like this blank. Let's 
fact, I'm going to include, get rid of everything that's in there. Okay. But normally when it times out, it just goes blank, then I press a button and it comes right back, you know. But here, it's like it goes blank, I press a button and it goes away. Now I'm getting the uh, pinwheel of death. <laughs> it's, it's grinding away. Reminds me of my uh, coffee grinder. Okay, <clears throat> so <laughs> there we go. Now we have now we have that all taken care of. We have correction on verse twelve. So again, it was revealed to them that not for themselves, but for you, they administered these things. Of course, these things still refer to the doctrine that we're talking about. They still refer, refer to what I had put in parents, okay? But it's these things, it's everything that's back beforehand, okay? Which now has been reported, slant taught to you through the ones having proclaimed the good news, slant gospel to you with the power of the Holy Spirit having been sent from heaven, into which angels have a strong desire, slant logging, to intently look, slant examine. So now what we're doing is we're actually moving in verse 13, we're going to be moving into a, uh, into a passage, at the beginnings of a passage, where Peter is going to give us instructions. Okay? He's going to tell us how to act. And all of the, the, rest of the, uh, the rest of the chapter, and in fact, the rest of the book, is based on these first 12 verses that we got in uh, the, this first chapter. In other words, what he does, his style is such that what he did is he jam-packed those first 12, uh, first 12 verses, right? He gave us all kinds of doctrine, all kinds of understanding. This is why you should love the Lord. This is why you should have this relationship. This is the information that you're getting. This is what he's done for you. He's provided salvation through the blood of Christ. He's given you, uh, you know, blessings. He's holding those blessings for you and making sure that you're actually going to get to heaven to receive them. I mean, all of this stuff that he's given us from verse 1 through 12, okay, is now going to be uh, uh, used as the basis for following and carrying out the instructions that come, okay, with a, a proper understanding of God's plan for us, a proper understanding of our position in life, our position in God's plan, right? He's been telling these individuals, and again, we have to keep in mind, you know, as part of the ICE principle, right, the, the uh, isagogics, making sure we understand what's going on at the time that we're studying, uh, okay, uh, or the time that it was written, excuse me. Now, <clears throat> the idea is that, He's concerned that they're going to get, you know, that they're going to undergo a severe pressure from Rome, right? And so he wants them to understand this fantastic relationship that they have, this fantastic existence that they have, that cannot be in any way, shape, or form harmed by Satan and whatever Satan is going to try to inflict on them, as long as they are functioning properly and staying in the plan of God, using God's power. Okay, and so we're going to start off with verse 13, and in verse 13, kind of spoiler alert here, but in verse 13, what we're going to say is that it all starts with having a proper mental attitude, and that, of course, only comes from having a sound uh, set of doctrine, that it only comes from being able to use the doctrine that you have, being able to rely and have confidence in God, and use the information that you have. Otherwise, you cannot have that mental attitude. See, what separates you from the unbelievers that you may know, okay, is watch them when things, when things start, uh, when pressures start hitting them. Watch them when, when challenges start hitting them. Do they handle them? Do they put them in God's hands? Do they do what they need to do, but then let the rest be God's responsibility? Is that what you do? That's what you should do. They can't do that because they're unbelievers. Right, And so what happens is they try to use their own mental uh, capacities and they get destroyed because you don't have the mental capacities to handle things like that, particularly huge pressures like what Satan is trying to do. Okay? And so it starts, it's not, you know, the old phrase, you are what you eat, right? Like Jack used to say, it's not you are what you eat, it's you are what you think. That's why it's important to have good thoughts, <laughs> to have proper thoughts associated with Bible doctrine. That's why it's important not to destroy those thoughts with human good and evil. By that I mean both. Human good, gee, I can do something on my own that's going to get me into heaven, right? I've got to be the world's best person. Those are, that's evil, right, in, in, in the guise of human good, or evil. 
gee, I'm going to fill my mind with pornography or with, you know, with uh, 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 disastrous type of stuff that eats away at your soul. You got to have a proper mental attitude based on doctrine. So that's what we're going to get in verse 13. Like I said, spoiler alert. Okay. So we start off verse 13 with a transition and it says, given this, therefore, comma, so given this, therefore, and we start with the conjunction dia, D-I-O. And dia is what's called an inferential conjunction and tells us that the following action can be inferred from what has already been stated. So again, you have those first 12 verses, and based on the information from the first 12 verses, you, you should be able to figure this out, okay? And this can be translated simply as, therefore, for this reason, or for this purpose, but to get the inf inferential context, we're translating it as, given this, therefore, okay? Given this, meaning the idea of everything that you've seen up to this point, given that, therefore, okay? And this, of course, is referring to all that Peter stated in verses 1 through 12. And then next, we have a, an idiom. <clears throat> it starts, and we have a couple participles here. It starts with the aorist middle participle of the nominative masculine plural verb anazonumi. Anazonumi. A N A D Z O N N U M I. On a zone numi, nu me, on a zone numi. And this is a compound verb, as you might expect when you get words that long. They're usually compounds. First, we have ana. Let me use my pointer. We have ana, whoop, <laughs> okay, which means, <clears throat> which means uh, middle, you know, middle, among, or in the midst of, okay. And then we have the verb zonumi. And so numi means to gird or bind up. And in the middle voice, it means to gird yourself up or bind yourself up. So the compound means to gird yourself up in the middle. Okay. And this ber verb, I mean this word, only appears in the Bible once. Guess where? Okay. <laughs> It's a test. You should all get 100. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a test. See if you're li listening. Okay. So it only occurs once in the Bible, but in extra biblical text, it's used uh, many times, and it's used with reference to, excuse me, to binding up the long garments or robes that they wore at the time to facilitate walking, okay, running, or working. Right, you know, the robes were great for, uh, you know, sitting around and talking, you know, or keeping yourselves warm by the fire or whatever, right? But when you had to work, right, they would, they would reach down, grab that guy, pull it up, and they always had a big belt, right? They'd reach that guy, grab it up, pull, you know, pull it up and tuck it into the belt. That was the binding piece, okay? And so they essentially made shorts out of their robe, okay, so that they could work. Uh, the thing that I remember, and because I'm one of those television movie kind of guys that I get these pictures in my head, the thing that I remember is there's a classic uh, Lucille Ball scene where she's got, she's with some Italians and she's going to squish grapes, okay, uh, to make wine. And she's got to get into this big bucket of grapes and she has on a long dress. And so that's what she ends up having to do. She pulls that thing up between her legs, right, you know, and ties it into the belt around her waist so that she can stomp the grapes. Okay, that's the idea here. And the idea is you do this for a reason. You do it because you're preparing for action. You're either going to do it because you're going to run. You're going to do it because you're going to work. Okay, you've got to uh, walk quickly or, or whatever. You can't just, you know, shuffle along. So the real, con the real connotation here is not just the binding up. It's the binding up as preparation for action. Okay, so it's binding up really to prepare for action. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, if you've ever read any of the, uh, the uh, Napoleonic books like, you know, like uh, Hornblower or anything like that, the old, uh, iron, the old wooden ships, right, they had to clear the decks for battle, right? When they would go into battle, one of the things they would do is, and if you've ever been on one, we got the opportunity to go on the HMS Victory, okay, the captain's quarters, the captain's quarters, everything was movable, 
right? Because what happened is when they got ready to go to battle, every space was used for, you know, for guns if they could, right? So the captain's quarters, they'd move his bunk out of the way, move the desk out of the way, move everything out of the way, and they had guns there, right? And all of the decks, okay, where they had their hammocks and all of that kind of stuff, that all got, that all got uh, uh, cleared off, okay? And they do a couple things. One, they'd put netting, okay, over everything so that if uh, a cannonball hit the wood and the splinters went flying, Right? That's how uh, uh, Admiral Nelson lost his arms. He got a big old splinter in it. Okay, the splinters went flying. They'd have they'd have uh, the netting to try and keep the splinters from flying. Okay, the other thing they would try and do is keep from uh, having a chain you know chain shot and all of that kind of stuff go through. But they'd clear the decks. Well, that's what you're doing when you're binding yourself up. You're clearing the decks, getting ready to run, getting ready to you know preparing to do something. And that's that's the whole purpose here. Okay. <clears throat> then next. Okay, so we have having, having bound in the middle. And then next we have the feminine accusative plural of the articular noun, ospus. O-S-P-H-U-S, ospus. I surprisingly didn't put an F this time. <laughs> That's funny because on the keyboard, when you go to the Greek keyboard, right, you know, the way you get the fee is by pushing an F. Okay, and so it's it's easy to when you're translating it back into English to type the same thing and end up getting the F instead of the PH. But anyway, ospus, and not surprisingly, this means to uh, it means the place where a belt or girdle is worn. It's the waist, okay, or the loins. So it's often translated loins. It's the place considered to be where the reproductive organs are, okay. <clears throat> uh, and it's considered to be, uh, it it's, has a connotation of a source of power, okay? The loin, excuse me, the loins have the mystical power of being able to uh, bring uh, children into the earth, okay? And, uh, and uh, the loins were, you know, were considered the, the uh, uh, well, place for virility, where power came from, right? I mean, and that went on for a long time. That's why you had cod pieces in the, you know, in medieval times. And, you know, the bigger the cod piece, the higher your status in uh, society and things like that. It was the loins, okay? <clears throat> so you, you, we have a binding yourself up in the middle of the loins. And then we have the feminine genitive singular. So another <clears throat> art, uh, uh, feminine, we have feminine genitive singular of an articular noun, dianoia. Dia noia, D I A N O I A, Dia noia. And Dia noia is also a compound word. Okay. It's composed of Dia, D I A, meaning through, like an arrow through, through uh, the target, meaning through, plus noose, which of course noose means mind. And therefore, dianoia means through the mind or through thinking. It means using the mind to think. It's an attitude or way of thinking. And then this is followed by the genitive plural of the second person personal pronoun, su. And su means you all, and of course, in the genitive, of you all. So this becomes the mind slant attitude of you or your mind slant attitude, okay? And so literally we have having bound in the middle slant girded for action, the loins of your mind slant thinking slant attitude, okay? And this of course refers to the concept of preparing yourself to function properly. It refers to having a proper mental attitude, okay? <clears throat> Therefore, I'm going to translate it literally with the meaning in parentheses, just so we understand. So we have having girded for action the loins of your thinking. Slant, and that means having prepared yourself for action with a proper mental attitude. Is that too low? Let me see if I can. Eh, I can't roll it up. Sorry. <laughs> I've got to remember not to go down below this, but it's having girded for action, the loins of your thinking slant, and then in parents with two lines through it, having prepared yourself for action with a proper mental attitude.
closed pair and the two lines through it. So one of the first things we're going to have to do is have that proper mental attitude. Again, that's going to come as a result of all of that information that came beforehand, all of that information, having a proper mental attitude because you understand what God has provided for you. You understand what he has. You have a love relationship. You're indwelled by God, the Holy Spirit. You're filled with the Spirit. You're functioning properly, okay? And then we follow with yet another participle. And here we have the present active participle. Masculine nominative plural, again, of a verb, nafo. Nafo, N-E-P-H-O, nafo. We are the knights that say nafo. <laughs> anyway, nafo. And this word's basic meaning is to not be under the influence of alcohol or to be sober. Then it's extended, okay, the connotation is to have a clear mind, so it's extended, okay, to mean well-balanced, to have self-control, to exercise self-restraint, or to be stable in all circumstances. See what happens when you're, when you're inebriated, right? You can't think straight. You can't walk straight, right? You know, the Pirates of the Caribbean, the whole kind of the way you know, Jack and Jack Sparrow walks all the time. He's kind of always like I'm right on the edge of being drunk, okay? <laughs> that, whole, that whole idea. There's no stability there. It's like you just go over and you could push him and have him fall over, right? Well, that translated then into a mental attitude. It translates into the mental stability. And so it's self-control, okay? Self-restraint or stability. The active voice means that the actions performed by the subject, which here are the properly functioning believers, as defined by the masculine nominative plural, <clears throat> that is in, in both participles, and the one before this, okay, actually the one before this, and uh, the present participle, this is called the present participle of simultaneous action, which means it denotes an action in progress with the action of the principal verb, okay, which we're going to see shortly. So this is, this is you know, happening while this verb is happening, okay, and therefore we're translating it as, or I'm translating it as, being constantly stabilized, comma. So the continuous action from, a, from the present participle is the being part, being constantly stabilized. So having girded for action the loins of your thinking, slant having prepared yourself for action with a proper mental attitude, comma, being constantly stabilized, Okay, we've got to be in those conditions first. Then we have to do the command. We have completely hope. Slant. That means have complete confidence. And so have complete confidence is in parents with two lines through it. So completely hope. Slant have complete confidence. Here we start with the adverb, teleos, teleos, actually, excuse me, teleos. <clears throat> T-E-L-E-I-O-S. Teleios. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and this adverb means fully, perfectly, completely, etc. And as a verb, yeah, we, we have the L-E-Y, I mean the L-Y uh, ending, so it's completely. And then we have the verb, which is the aorist active imperative. And so it's an imperative. This is a command. Okay, Peter's telling us we have to do this. Aorist active imperative, second person plural, of the verb elpizo. E-L-P-I-D-Z, long O, elpizo. E-L-P-I-D-Z, long O. Elpizo. And this is obviously a cognate of the noun elpis, 
which we've seen many times. Galpus means hope as a confident expectation. Okay, for example, I'm hoping for Christmas means that I have a confident expectation that Christmas is going to occur. Okay? <clears throat> and it will occur. There's nothing that's going to stop it. We may end up uh, having the rapture and we won't be here when it occurs, <laughs> okay? But, but we do know that the existence of the earth is going to go on, so the earth's not going to blow up and keep Christmas from happen happening, okay? So we can have a confident expectation that Christmas is going to occur, okay? So <clears throat> that's the noun. That's the hope. It's not, it's not a, a, subjunct a subjunctive type of noun, which means maybe it will, maybe it won't, right? Like, uh, you know, I, I uh, uh, hope I win the lottery. Right? That's not what this means. Okay? This means a confident expectation, and therefore the verb means to have confidence. And of course, with complete, we have have complete confidence. So the, the literal translation is completely hope, but the actual meaning is have complete confidence. Okay? So completely hope, slant have complete hope, uh, confidence on the grace being brought to you. on the grace being brought to you. And we start here with the preposition epi plus the accusative, epi plus the accusative. Uh, epi with the genitive means on, over, or when. With the dative, it means on the basis of, at, <clears throat> and with the accusative, the word means on, to, or against. So I have on. So you're hoping, you're having complete confidence on something, on the grace being brought to you. Okay? Next, we have yet another participle. We have the adjectival participial phrase. In this case, it's a whole phrase, adjectival participial phrase, which we'll skip and we go to the noun. Uh, because it's an adjective, but it kind of the participle we we take and move to the end. Okay, the noun is the feminine accusative singular of the articular noun we've seen many times. Caris, C A R I S, caris, and caris means graciousness, favor, or kindness. And it's extended technically to mean grace. Grace being all that God is free to do for mankind based on the actions of Christ on the cross. So we translate this as grace. Something we don't earn or deserve, but we get as a result of Christ's action. Okay? Then we go back, we get the adjectival, <laughs> adjectival participial phrase, which modifies this noun. And we start with the present passive participle, feminine accusative singular, of a verb, pharaoh. P H E long, I mean, P H E R long O, pharaoh. And this is not the ruler of Egypt. This is actually, <laughs> this is actually a verb, okay? And pharaoh means to bear or carry from one place to another. To bring, to take along, And then, it's and then it's extended to mean to bear or grant a favor. And here it has a little bit of that connotation when you think of grace. Grace is God giving us a favor. <laughs> you know? So it has a little bit of that connotation in it. Okay? But the idea is it's being brought. It's being carried. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I didn't. I didn't check. I just thought of it as I was sitting here reading it. I didn't check, but it. You know, it seems awfully close to uh, to the word that we use for ferrying something, right? You know, when we ferry something across the river from one side to the other, or when you when you ferry, you know, as a ferrier, when you change, you know, when you carry it from one place to another. Okay, um, <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe that is the root of the word. But anyway, pharaoh means to to bring or to uh, to carry. Okay. Uh, this is this then is followed by because that's just the that's just the participle part. We've got a participial phrase. It's followed by the dative plural of the second person personal pronoun su once again, meaning you all in the plural. 
And as a data plural, we have two you all. And therefore, the phrase becomes being brought to you all, or simply being brought to you. So we have on the grace being brought to you. See, that's how, when you say, how's that an adjective? Well, it's an adjective because it's defining, it's, it's modifying the grace, right? You could say on the being brought to you grace, which is the way they say it in the Greek. <laughs> okay, they have the participle first. Okay, but it's on the grace being brought to you. Okay. And then <clears throat> we finish the sentence. With one more phrase. Okay, and this is telling us <clears throat> how the grace is coming to us. Okay, and we have in connection with the revelation of Jesus Christ, period. In connection with the revelation of Jesus Christ. We start with the preposition en, en plus the dative. And we've seen this word many times, and its basic meaning is in, inside of, or within. Like a lot of the little two-letter words, okay, it really has, uh, you know, pages and pages when you go into the, uh, into the uh, uh, lexicon, okay. And here what we have is we have it in a special use. That's actually number eight in the Bauer Art Gangrick and Danker. But uh, it's used as a marker denoting the object to which something happens or in which something shows itself or by which something is recognized. Okay? And when it's used like that, it's uh, uh, <clears throat> we have to or by or in connection with. And so in connection with makes the best, you know, makes the, uh, the, the, the best translation. The idea being in connection with, and so it's being revealed, right? We have the grace is being revealed, okay? And it's being revealed in this certain way, so it's in connection with this revelation, okay? So <clears throat> here the idea is that the latter is telling us that this grace is going to be brought to us at some point or when something happens, and therefore it's in connection with. We then have a feminine dative. We said this; it was in plus the dative. Well, we have the feminine dative singular of the noun that we just saw a couple verses back. Apocalypsis. Apocalypsis. A-P-O-K-A-L-U-P-S-I-S. So it's apocalypsis. Apocalypsis. And this word means make fully known, revealing or disclosing. And then it's used technically to mean the revelation or a second advent of Christ. Here, of course, the translation is the revelation. And this is the date of advantage to us. We're going to receive our full glory and grace at this time. <clears throat> and then finally, we have two words, both of which are in the masculine genitive singular. Okay. And it's Jesus Christos or Christo. Yeah. Did I do it backwards? Jesus Christos. Let me look real quick. Oops. Yes, okay. Jesus Christos, yeah, that's the right word. <clears throat> it doesn't look, it doesn't, my, uh, my uh, iPad doesn't have the font for Greek, so I have to kind of translate in my head what I'm looking at. So, <laughs> Jesus Christos, and it's Jesus Christ. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Jesus, of course, is the Greek transliteration of Joshua. 
And it's used that way when speaking of Joshua, the successor of Moses. And we have that in Acts 7.45 and Hebrews 4.8. And those, Jesus, is actually translated as Joshua. But it's technically transliterated to Jesus when we're speaking about our Lord. And that's, of course, what we're doing here. And it's our Lord with emphasis on his humanity. Remember when we go through the, uh, the uh, communion service that Jesus uh, refers to the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. when we're looking at it from a hypostatic union. Okay, So the emphasis is on the, the humanity. And then Christos means the anointed one or the Messiah. And it's transliterated to Christ. And that, that means uh, the, the, our Lord with emphasis on him being in hypostatic union. Okay? And of course, uh, Peter would use these two words, and he uses them in this order. Okay, First, because of Christ, uh, the humanity of the Christ, which they've heard about, and some of them actually had the opportunity, perhaps, to see. Okay? And then the hypostatic union is brought up, because, uh, you know, finishes it off, because the hypostatic union is what uh, uh, resulted Okay, in Christ being able to uh, function and go to the cross and provide everything that happened in verses 1 through 12. Okay, so he doesn't just say, Lord, okay, that would have been the deity part of it. He really emphasizes what Christ has done for us by using Christ, and he makes it personal by talking about the, the humanity of Christ, okay? We're not just talking about, you know, we're not just talking about uh, Joe Schmo down the street. We're talking about the God-man. Okay, the individual who's in hypostatic union, okay, who's also uh, uh, had in the first advent. So we have Jesus Christos, okay? Uh, <clears throat> in the genitive, of course, we get the free word of, so we would have of Christ, uh, I mean, uh, of Jesus, of Christ, okay? And together, we have, of course, we just have of Jesus Christ, okay? So in connection with the revelation of Jesus Christ. So... All together, whew, all together we have, given this, therefore, having girded for action the loins of your thinking, which means having prepared yourself for action with a proper mental attitude, be constantly stabilized, completely hope, slant have complete confidence on the grace being brought to you in connection with the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is a command. This, mean, this command tells us that we're supposed to have Okay, confidence in. We're supposed to be able to have mental stability as a result of understanding the grace of God, understanding what's going to come. Still, understanding the above and beyond blessings that we're going to receive. Understanding our maturity, where we are, having a personal sense of destiny, knowing where we're going. When people say, do you know where you're going when you die? Yes, I sure do. And I've known it for a long time, ever since I was saved. And I know how to get there. And I know what it takes. Okay, <laughs> and let me tell you, because if you don't know where you're going, I can tell you. <laughs> Either way, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. <laughs> okay, so the idea is having that understanding, knowing what's going to happen with the revelation. Okay, so one more time, given this, therefore, having girded for action the loins of your thinking, or having prepared yourself for action with a proper mental attitude, being constantly stabilized. Completely hope, so have complete confidence on the grace being brought to you in connection with the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we got what it says. Let's go ahead and get at the analysis. Okay? So analysis. Verse point one. Verses one and two, or excuse me, verses one through twelve. Lay the theological foundation for everything that follows, period. Peter has packed into the first 12 verses multiple doctrines concerning God's work of redemption okay so Peter's packed into the first 12 verses multiple doctrines concerning God's work of redemption in our lives
as a basis for joy and worship. Now, in verse 13, he gives the first imperative command. Based on that information, to his readers, semicolon, and it is connected inextricably. I-N-E-X-T-R-I-C-A-B-L-Y, inextricably, meaning you can't be extracted. They're so tightly wound that you can't pull them apart, okay? So it's connected inextricably with everything that went before, period. Point two. Verse 13 is a main hinge on which the whole letter turns, period. So we need to understand verse 13. We have to understand verse 13 as the basis, right? If you have a door, okay, and you have, it, you have a hinge on the door, and the door isn't anchored securely to the door frame, right? When you go to open the door, the door falls off, okay? Or it won't open, or it sticks, or it makes noises, or it doesn't function properly, right? I mean, that's, that's why I, uh, I've, I've tried. I'm not good at putting doors up. I've tried putting, you know, buying doors that aren't pre-hung, right? Trying to buy doors and then put my own hinges on and then try and hang them. I tried doing that in a shed one time. Forget it. I can't, it, you know, I can't do it. It's, it requires a special skill. You got to be smarter than I am to figure out how to do that. <laughs> okay. There are, there are carpenters that, you know, they do that all their lives and they know they've got all the tools and they go zip, 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 and the door goes right up and then, you know, it goes everywhere. Mine, you know, I would, I would either, it wouldn't work or, you know, you put it one place and it just start going, won't get to close itself or whatever, right? You know? So in order to avoid that, I buy what's called pre-hung doors and sort of got the frame around it. And then I just put the frame in the hole and I'm done. Okay. <laughs> but, but that's how important a hinge is. Okay. I'm not saying it just to, you know, uh, uh, you know, bemoan my horrible carpentry skills, but to, you know, to talk about the fact that this, this verse, okay, is important. It is the foundation. It's, it's, it's the, you know, what's called the hinge pin. It's what, what causes everything to move freely, to move properly. And in our case, to move properly in the plan of God for our lives. Okay? Continue the point. Peter is giving us this verse So Peter is giving us this verse as the anchoring point on which the rest of the letter rides, period. Starting here, he is going to give instructions to his readers. But he has spent 12 verses making sure their actions are anchored securely in the truth. Point three. Peter is saying that because of the personal love slant joy
in Jesus, comma, because the triune God is at work securing your salvation, comma, Because God, by his power, is ensuring that you make it to receive the inheritance that he is keeping for you, comma, You must do this okay so all that stuff up front leads to you've got to do this okay and it's essential that we see the connection here right uh, that we understand how the first 12 verses fit into this one if we rip the following verses out of the grammatical connection Okay, with what precedes, if you just start trying to take verse 13 and, and following by itself, okay, without that, without that connection, okay, you're doing what I was talking about. You're ripping the door off the hinges, okay? You can't have this mental attitude. You can't have this confidence. You can't understand the grace without first understanding everything that came in those first 12 verses, without understanding what the blood of Christ means, without understanding what it is to have an inheritance, to have that inheritance protected, to have God, the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, uh, watching it, to have to have the guarantee that you're going to get there, that Satan is not going to keep you from receiving that blessing. That's what establishes all of the mental attitude and that confidence to have and understand this grace. So it starts off with the mental attitude and everything that's developed as a result of all of that doctrine. I mean, he just gave, you know, when I, when I look at uh, Schaeffer's an eight-volume set of, uh, of uh, books uh, the, for uh, Schaeffer's theology, okay? Uh, uh, the other, uh, another theology that I have, now Schaeffer's, or, you know, his eight volumes are about that thick. Another one I have is three volumes, each about that thick, <laughs> okay? It's, it's one of those, it's like opening the unabridged dictionary, you know, you get that theology out, you get volume one, and you go, poof, <laughs> yeah, you know, and you flip it open, you know, it's, a, it's like, uh, you know, ooh, I'm going to cast a spell or something, you know, I grab the corner of the book and flip it over, you know? <laughs> but, but, but all of that is theological information, and Peter just kind of jams, you know, 90% of that, right, you know, into, uh, into these first 12 verses. We have salvation, we have, we have hypostatic union, we have angelology, where he's talking about uh, being able to be provided by, you know, provided for, uh, you know, in, in, in our guarantee of, uh, of uh, having a bodyguard, all of that kind of stuff is all in that first 12 verses. And that doctrine, he knows they have received. And he was just reminding them of it, okay, so that they would have this hope, this mental attitude, this confidence, okay? <clears throat> so he ripped the door off the hinges, okay, if we did that. And, and, and we would, you know, if you go ripping the door off the hinges, okay, if you don't have the confidence in God, what does that leave? That leaves confidence in yourself. Okay, and so what happens is you end up trying to impress God by your own performance. You try to win his favor. You try to seek proper function as a result of what you think is right. And then we have religion, okay, as opposed to Christianity. We have individuals trying to win the approbation of God based on what they think is right. Because they haven't taken the time to learn it. They haven't taken the time to screw their, their uh, hinge into the door and into the door frame. And instead they have this door that's just hanging there. And the first time they run into trouble, it comes right off. And they don't have the ability to function properly in God's plan because they don't know God's plan. They're trying to do it on their own. Okay? And that's where we're going to go ahead and stop. It's a good breaking point. It sets us up for the actual analysis of the phrase itself in terms of the words that are there. These first three points, of course, give you the, the background as to, as to well, what's happening and why. And I wasn't clicking any of these. So there we go. For those of you out, in, out in TV land, uh, point two was verse three is the hinge. 
okay? And, and point three is we have to understand one through 12 to understand 13 and following, okay? And 13 and following really means to the end of the letter, okay? But uh, we're going to talk about to the end of the chapter, okay? And so at this point, <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and function properly with respect to true spiritual giving. And we understand that the timetable and the concept of true spiritual giving is located in 1 Corinthians 16.2. It says, on the first day of every week, that's today, that's Sunday, Sunday is the first day of the week, that each one of you, according to his own judgment, be putting aside and saving, according to how he might be prospering. Okay? What, what, what does that tell us? What is this first verse associated with giving? How do we relate it to what we were just talking about? It's talking about a proper mental attitude. Right? It's talking about according to his own judgment. Where does that judgment come from? That judgment comes from an understanding of doctrine understanding in your soul of what giving is about, okay? Not tithing, giving, okay? Two different concepts. Then we have the dictate and the principle given to us in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one should give just as he himself has de decided what is the right amount, where? In his heart, slant right lobe, not out from sorrow, pain, distress, reluctance, related to the personal loss of funds, nor out from compulsion, slant pressure. For you see, the God keeps on loving a cheerful, satisfied giver. Again, cheerful, satisfied giver is someone who's functioning properly in the divine dynasphere, the one who has the proper mental attitude based on doctrine, the one who's giving as a result not of pressure, either internal or externally, but as a result of knowledge, a result of God's desire, a result of understanding of God's plan and what it takes for God's plan to operate and your personal destiny. See how it's tying together. And then we have a dictate and a promise given to us in Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. It says, honor the Lord from your prosperity and from the first of all your income. And if you do, your storehouses shall be filled with superabundance and your vats shall overflow with new wine. Now, the idea here, though, is that we aren't doing it for that reason. We aren't doing it to get the new wine, to get the overflowing vats. We're doing it because we have the proper mental attitude, right? We're doing it. Okay, and then as a result of doing it, we're showing that we can handle the capacity that we have and that we uh, actually uh, are, are up for more capacity. And of course, God always fulfills and gives us more capacity and then fills it as associated with Proverbs 10, 3. Okay, and then the fact that the real issue in true spiritual giving is doctrine resident in the soul and the fact that doctrine is a true wealth of God's economy plus a very important warning is given to us in 2 Corinthians 8.12. It says, for if positive volition based upon doctrine is present, this is perfectly acceptable to the degree that we might be having. Okay, so that tells us that positive volition itself with an exhale of temporal prosperity from zero to maximum is perfectly acceptable because it's coming from the proper mental attitude, right? But then it goes on to say it is not perfectly acceptable to the degree that it is not having, meaning that if you destroy the positive volition, if you decide to give what, what uh, you don't have, what does that mean? That means you're, you're functioning on human good and evil. You're trying to bribe God. I'm going to give you what I don't have, and you need to give it back to me, right? I'm going to pay you off. I'm giving you a loan. It's an IOU, God, okay? I'm going to get, you know, and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, I'll pay it, or, or you, you, know, you, you give it to me so that I can pay it, right? That's all, that's all improper mental attitude. So it is not perfectly acceptable to the degree that he is not having. So the idea is that if you don't have temporal uh, prosperity and you want to have temporal prosperity, so you can give in the temporal area, what do you do? You pray. You go to God in prayer. And if you pray properly, your prayer will be answered. And it may be answered negatively, which means you still end up with no prosperity. But now you have the mental attitude and the understanding that, gee, that's not part of God's plan for my life. Personal sense of destiny. I understand what God's doing for me. Okay? Or you do get it. Another personal sense of destiny. I prayed for prosperity. Boom, I've got prosperity. I need to exhale back some of this. That's what I prayed for. That's why I prayed for it. Okay? So we have that given to us in 2 Corinthians 9, 8. Now, the God keeps on being manifestly able to richly provide all grace to you in order that while always having complete self-sufficiency in everything, meaning you have everything necessary you need, excuse me, everything necessary for you to function properly in your role, okay, you so that you all might be providing richly to every divine good work slant production. So if it's God's desire to provide blessing to enable you to fulfill his capacity for giving, to fill your capacity for giving, then God has all the ability in the universe to do so. So we're going to go ahead now and take our normal few moments of silence, designed, of course, to uh, mainly to give you the opportunity to go to God in prayer and exhale uh, your understanding and, and the prosperity you've received from the spiritual area. And then also to we will pass a container around so that if you've been, been prospered in the temporal area and you've decided to give, you have the opportunity to do that. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you <clears throat> not only for this opportunity to give in the temple area if we've been prospered, but also the wonderful opportunity to give back to you a portion of what we receive from you in terms of our understanding of doctrine and what you've provided for us. To understand that <clears throat> information that Peter has been giving us in these in this first 12 verses, the understanding of salvation and what it means, everything you gave to us as a result of that salvation, the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit, the spiritual gift, everything that we have associated with that. And then you didn't stop there. You gave us the opportunity to get doctrinal information, to function properly in a congregation and advance in ranks, to be able to lead and grow to maturity to, so that we will have above and beyond blessing and in time. <clears throat> in time. And then you didn't stop there. You gave us the opportunity to continue to learn, to continue to in our maturity, to continue to understand and have a personal sense of destiny and then be able to understand what we're going to receive as above and beyond blessing in <clears throat> eternity. And for that, we are truly grateful and we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close with a song. Uh, if you'll stay.